Hi, everyone. Apologies for the delay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick kick things off just to get us started really quickly. Um, welcome to Health and Wellbeing, a Corporate Responsibility. Our presenters today are Jennifer and Toby from Empower Translate. Um, I'm going to let you guys go ahead and kick things off and introduce yourselves um, and have a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Um, thank you, everyone. It's um, great to have you all here. We're here to discuss um, a very important topic for us, health and well-being, um, a corporate responsibility. So Richard Branson, founder of the Virgin Group and one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world, once said, train people well enough so they can leave, but treat them well enough that they don't want to. So what does treat them well enough mean? This in part relates to people's health and well-being, and this is a topic that we are focusing on today. So in the UK, it is a legal requirement for employers to protect the physical health and safety of their teams in the workplace and to a certain extent at home as well. At work, we must ensure that we adhere to fire safety guidelines, complete risk assessments, and ensure that our teams complete regular health and safety refresher training. However, we are yet to see legislation and government implemented guidelines in place to protect the mental health and safety of our employees in the UK. And this is something that is crucial to each and every one of us. And this is why during our presentation to you today, we will be focusing on the mental health side of employee wellbeing. So let's begin with a clear definition of mental health. The World Health Organization defines the term of mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual can realize their own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of day-to-day -day life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their own community. Over the course of your life, if you have experienced mental health problems, your thinking, mood, and behavior could be affected, and it can have a huge impact on your employment, your friends, and your family. One in four people will be affected in their lifetimes. To put that into context, if you have an organization of 100 employees, statistically speaking, at least 25 of those are most likely to experience mental health problems. So take a moment now to think about yourselves, your colleagues, employees, and the stakeholders that you interact with on a daily basis. What one thing do we all have in common? We're all people, and we're all individually unique, and we all react differently to different situations. So let's start by introducing the two unique people sat in front of your screens. So welcome to everyone. I'm Jen Perryman. I'm the head of HR and I'm in the fortunate position of where I can directly and positively impact the health and well-being of our fantastic team here at Empower. I've spent 15 years in people management as an area manager responsible for teams from all different backgrounds and experiences. I'm an avid crossfitter, I'm a terrible baker, and a single mum to my two young children. And I moved specifically to HR a couple of years ago and I'm currently completing my level five Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development HR Diploma alongside work. I have a mental health first aid qualification and I'm starting a counselling course to enhance my CPD next year. So this conversation is deeply important to me. Not only have I experienced mental health issues in my own life, I have supported close friends with their own issues. And I've also worked for organizations that have not considered the mental health of their teams. And it's given me the determination to ensure that I use my voice and stand up for what I think is important. Hi again, everyone. I'm Toby Parkinson. Since I started at Empower about five years ago, I've held various different roles. Uh, I started off as an intern, and then I, I became talent hub manager or vendor manager. Uh, to my current position as head of production. A little bit about me, I love my football, I love my motorbikes, 
And I also love my dogs who love me back, but mostly when I'm eating. In my time here, I've had the pleasure of directly managing people for over four years with everyone having very different backgrounds, strengths, capabilities, and triggers. To assist me in supporting them, I've undertaken training and learning with the Institute of Leadership and Management, the ILM, which has been extremely eye-opening for me. So health and well-being is important to me simply because I care. Having suffered myself, I understand firsthand the impact that it can have not only at work, but also in day-to-day -day life. So well-being is something that both Jen and I care very deeply about. And so the question we'd like to ask today is, what should your company be doing to support your team's health and well-being? And how can your company manage this effectively? COVID-19 has indirectly brought this subject to the light more than ever before, and has put a microscopic lens on people's health and well-being. And it's easy to see why. So who would have thought that March 2020 would see many of us pack up our computer equipment, clear down our office desks, and head home to start to navigate through this new way of working. And during the spring of 2020, the internet was filled with images of varied home setups, from laptops at an ironing boards, to parents juggling conference calls with mathematics for 10 year olds. And when we once had clear boundaries between work and home, we started to face a situation where in many cases, it became difficult to distinguish between the two. And for many of us, our working environment had been significantly impacted with thousands of jobs lost and women impacted at higher rates than men. We've spent some time reviewing many, many studies from the biomedical public health to CIPD, the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. And although the Royal Society of Public Health reported that overall, more people felt working from home was better for their health and well-being, one trend was very clear. People who switched to working from home as a result of the pandemic were at higher risk of having their health and well-being impacted, with the most common challenges being feeling less connected to colleagues, doing less exercise, disturbed sleep, and increased stress levels. We must also recognize that negative stress can be triggered from many different sources that are not always work-related. And this can include things such as bereavement, divorce, moving house, loneliness, or other medical conditions. The COVID-19 pandemic brought an unprecedented strain on us as individuals and groups that we hadn't experienced before. And I'm sure that we've all experienced times in our lives, maybe even recently, that have affected our mental health, and we've still put on that brave face and navigated through the stresses. The Health and Safety Executive Agency reported that in 2019 to 2020, stress, depression or anxiety accounted for 51% of all work-related ill health cases. And 55% of all working days lost were due to work-related ill health. Whilst for many of us, a return to the office represents a sense of much needed normality, Research by the CIPD found that more than two fifths of the UK workforce have previously expressed anxieties around returning to the workplace. So why is this so important to your business? And why should you prioritize your team's mental well-being? Let's talk business. You can be expected to see increased top line profit, reduced absence levels and increased staff retention a reduction in costly recruitment expenses, and minimise timely and costly performance management issues. You can see improved staff morale, meaning improved productivity and also innovation, heightened motivation and team development, which can lead to internal promotions and skill growth. You can expect to see an enhanced reputation as an employer who really cares for their staff, and future-proofing your brand in a conscious consumer world. So now for the big question, how do we start to get there? 
and what support is needed for your team members. First of all, let's take a look at some of the big players. We teased out some information from international organizations with a lot more budget, resources, and team members than us, just to get some examples of best practice. At Microsoft, they have a company health initiative called Microsoft Cares, which offers in-person, digital, and telephone counseling, as well as support groups and workshops for all employees. Employees also share their mental health stories between themselves. And it, this is something that happened organically rather than through a structured program. And it is a major selling point for them when it comes to recruitment. That is aside from being one of the biggest and most innovative companies in the world. At Innocent Smoothies, a healthy juice and smoothie company in the UK, they offer a range of perks that indirectly ease staff's work stresses, such as flexible working hours, free breakfasts, and free gym memberships to encourage workers to be healthy and happy through exercise. The brand also offers a yoga club, which is a great way for people to practice mindfulness. And they have an employee assistance program in place, which allows anyone who works at Innocent to talk to someone 24 hours a day. Unilever have a global well-being steering committee who in turn have created a four pillar well-being framework to address the physical, mental, emotional and purposeful well-being of employees. They hold purpose workshops to address what they want from their careers and take time for deep reflection. Unilever's mission statement reads, we are committed to promoting mental health within our business and beyond. And twice a year, they promote mental health specific communications for employees, including on World Mental Health Day in October. And they also offer 24 seven support for their team. So what can we do? We've put together some ideas for you to think about just based on our experiences. And we've defined support into two categories, reactive support, and proactive support. Let's start with the support that you might consider to create a standard framework approach to the well-being of your teams. Proactive. There really are many examples of proactive support that you can put in place as an organisation and we would like to share just a few key ones with you today. So let's start with the most important one of all, having this open conversation and understanding its purpose. And then having a similar conversation as a team and introducing mental health and well-being as part of your ongoing dialogue with your team is extremely beneficial. It really is the first step to endorse a positive company culture and environment. And you can do this through one-to-ones, company meetings, intranet content or other internal literature. And it needs to be across all areas of the business and communication from a CEO filtered down to the rest of the team has been proved to be very effective. So now that you've opened up the conversation, we need to keep it alive. So perhaps you can run mental health awareness days or staff training, or think about your office environment and how you may be able to make improvements. Ensure that you have a wellbeing policy that highlights the company's guidelines for handling work-related stress and take a moment to review your other policies, including office conduct and harassment and bullying. Are all the key messages consistent? And do they send the message that you treat team members as human beings that have feelings? And take a look at your current team benefits and initiatives. Do they support positive wellbeing for your team? And are there ways that you can effectively Enhance them to endorse an environment where your team feel safe, acknowledged and appreciated. Ensure that your human resources teams incorporate well-being discussions from the very beginning of a new team member's journey. So within a staff induction, you set that precedence that as an organisation, you really do take mental health seriously. And build open communication channels with your teams from the very first day so then they are more likely to feel comfortable discussing any difficult topics. And if you've not already got in place, think about introducing 
an employee assisted program across your organization for your teams to access as and when required. These programs assist employees with personal problems and work related problems that may impact their job performance, their health, their mental and emotional well being. Staff engagement surveys can be a really great tool to measure your team's feedback. For many, a confidential survey is a safe way to give feedback about things they are not really satisfied about. And as a business, having this first-hand feedback is invaluable and it allows you to know what actions that you can take. As people managers, it's really important to protect time and space for your teams. A simple, how are you doing today? Or tell me about your weekend can be a really simple yet powerful message that you really do have time to speak to people and that you care. And these conversations can be during your regular catch-ups or stopping to speak to somebody when making a coffee. And we really must appreciate how much harder this can often be in this new remote environment that many of us are still in. So sometimes a coffee break on Microsoft Teams or Zoom can make all the difference. Line managers and HR need to be really proactive in having regular discussions with team members. Are your people fully switching off from work or are they regularly checking emails outside of work hours? We have a responsibility to ensure that we understand the importance of switching off and disengaging with work at the end of the day. And we must remember that staff match the behavior of the hierarchy and that if they see exec level leaders responding to emails out of hours, then they also could feel pressurized to do the same. And this could lead to increased levels of anxiety and stress for people who never really feel disengaged from the office space. Your team members' development should be an absolute priority. And as human beings, we all consciously or subconsciously have a thirst for growth. And we need to know that we are continuously learning and developing. And CPD can either be driven by yourselves in line with business needs or by individuals' wants. Something that I've personally found very effective is just giving people time and space to have a moan and complain. Many of us have an emotional attachment to work and we need somewhere to be able to vent our frustrations and be heard. You can even make your resources not only accessible to your internal teams, but perhaps for any other stakeholders such as freelancers or your other partnerships to support them too. It's vital to have things in place to proactively support positive mental health, mental well-being, as this limits the amount of time reactive support is needed, although reactive support is still very much a thing. Reactive support is about the person and being adaptable to their situation. As a people manager, it can be surprisingly difficult to not attempt to solve your team's issues. Listen, no really, listen, don't interrupt. In her book, Time to Think, Nancy Klein highlights the importance of active listening, which a book I can really highly recommend. Be empathetic. Think about your body language, demonstrate patience for the situation and understanding, and signpost to relevant help such as your EPA, mental health charities, or advise that they speak to their doctor. Identify each individual sign so that you're able to pick up on it quickly and offer or seek support in the early stages. We're not suggesting pushing people to the breaking point and see what signs they show. We're suggesting having the conversation with them as everyone shows different signs. When you have a team member return to your business after a period of absence, what conversations are you having to establish the reasons behind the absence and what support needs to be considered for that individual? Ensure that you have a robust return to work policy and documents in place. Are you confident that they didn't take absence because of stress related issues? If you're finding that staff members are often reaching burnout, what steps do you take to investigate? Is work being shared fairly and equally? 
our expectations and deadlines unreasonable. You have a unique opportunity to make adjustments so that future occurrences don't happen. So be open to making these adjustments to the way in which it may need to work for each individual. So do we practice what we preach? Absolutely. At Empower, we've really been fortunate enough to be able to adopt mental well-being as a core value within the company. And we've implemented a range of support, both proactive and reactive. And a combination of all these things has allowed us to create a positive working environment and to ensure that we have the tools and resources in place to support every single member of our team, whatever the situation. And the results? Well, the figures really do speak for themselves. So year to date, our staff retention rate is 91%. We're able to support team members to have time to themselves through me days, because we believe that regular breaks from work allow us to re-energize, focus on ourselves and spend time enjoying the important parts of our lives. And this can lead to a decrease in work-related absence. In 2020, our team of 20 completed 1200 hours of continual professional development. And 21% of our team this year have either been promoted or moved to a different position internally, spreading knowledge and confidence, and on the fiscal front, resulting in dramatically reduced recruitment costs. Through effective HR and IT resources, we work continuously to support everyone through the remote or hybrid working environments that we find ourselves in. But don't just take mine and Toby's word for it. We asked a few members of the team to give us some insights into how our health and well-being initiatives have impacted them and the responses we got were fantastic. One team member stating that throughout their career, they feel we are the first company to take a genuine interest in their health and well-being. The Me Day initiative reinforces that we have people at the heart of what we do and is a, a perfect opportunity for everyone to rest and reset, having a positive impact on both mental and physical health. Frequent check-ins allow them to focus on stresses openly and honestly in a supported and encouraging environment. And they also state that Empower's initiatives nurture everyone's ability to perform at the best in a supportive network. Another team member praised the Me Days as being absolutely fantastic and claiming they've made a huge difference to their mental well-being. They always feel supported by our HR team and really enjoy the fun quizzes and celebrations like International Joke Day or most recently International Gratitude Day, as these help bring everyone together in our remote working environment. If you are committed to prioritizing your team's mental well-being and be open to this conversation, you will see a team that will follow you into battle. A dedicated collective of brilliant and creative individuals who will have a reason to wholeheartedly commit to you and your business. A little bit like these guys. Or, as Richard Branson said, you'll train people well enough so they can leave, but you'll treat them well enough so they don't want to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toby and Jane, and my apologies for not introducing you on time, but I, I wasn't teleported to your, your session in time. Um, I'm Sharon Tabraham from ST Communications. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you that have uh, come into the chat line. I'm not sure if Gala can get those onto the screen for you, but the first one was a comment from Ian Shin, and he said that I noticed that initially employees loved working from home, but after a few months, it started to weigh on them emotionally and was hard on their overall well-being. So I instituted a virtual office time where once a week for an hour, we created a virtual office where they continued to work while seeing each other's faces and he got a, an overwhelming positive response to that. I don't know if you have anything to say on that. Um, we also had a, a comment from Agnes, who is in Budapest, and um, she said, my question uh, relates to authenticity. How can one know that this how are you reflects true curiosity and caring? 
does it have to at all or can we be happy about the other person making the effort at least yeah in in response um to that it's a, it's a really brilliant point um sometimes just by asking somebody how are you um can be enough because it shows that care and that effort other times you can see sometimes that the other person could be perhaps hesitant to really respond. And sometimes just a simple sort of, how really are you? Um, do you want to, you know, should we go and have a bit of time together? Just that exploring again and not just taking, yes, I'm fine, you know, as sort of an immediate response. Um, but I think just just initially given that, um, that how are you in the first place can mean so much to people, I think, especially during current times. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, a question from Rosaria Gray, who is a localization manager at Crown. Um, how does the me day work? Is it an extra vacation day or is it a free day? Toby, do you want to answer this yeah, one? Yeah, I'll, I'll on that. I think Jen knows more about this one than me. But um, a, a me day is essentially a, an extra vacation day that's given by the company. Um, it it doesn't have to be taken, and it can be taken away as well. Um, but it, it's a set day every single month uh, where to to give people time for themselves, and that can be. I, I had mine uh, a couple of weeks ago and I did, I fixed loads and loads of things around the house and it just alleviated so much stress from me. I, I've got another one coming up in two weeks where I'm going to go and help my dad move all of his stuff from his house. So again, just I, it gives that time and that space to do what we need to do outside of work, but during working hours. If yeah. anybody's cars break broken down, garages are only open nine till five, <laughs> and we all work nine to five, so it's yeah. so it's to do those kinds of things. Yeah, so, it's yeah. totally different times, and um, I think we all need a me day. Um, last question, I think, because there's like a minute and a half before I will be teleported out. But how easy would it be, do you think, to implement some of your suggestions to a remote working team? or even uh, across teams in different countries? Yeah, this, this has very much been a challenge that I think many businesses have faced. Um, we certainly had to adapt mainly our communication channels. Um, we're having to use Teams in the most sort of effective way. Um, it's very different or being in an office environment where you can kind of all check in on each other and, and see each other and have that human contact you have to safeguard time